When you hear the term landlord, what's the first image that pops into your mind? As rental property owners, we've always faced negative stereotypes. People think we're greedy. People think we're selfish. People think that we don't care about our tenants. And some people think that we raise rent on purpose. In reality, prices have gone up for everyone. Tenants are struggling with higher rents and property owners are struggling with higher expenses when they try to repair and maintain their properties. This is due to a confluence of different factors. But nevertheless, we do face very negative stereotypes that have been around for a very long time, when in fact, we are hardworking small business owners and entrepreneurs who provide a valuable service to our communities. So how can we fight against these negative stereotypes while putting our best selves forward as we try to come up with constructive solutions to solve the housing dilemma? Today, we're going to hear from a guest speaker who has some suggestions. I think you'll be interested to hear what he has to say. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to episode two of our series about housing policy and property rights, brought to you by the Small Property Owners Association, also known as SPOA. My name is Amir Shah Savari. I'm the vice president of SPOA. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Roger Valdez, who is the director of the Center for Housing Economics and a research fellow at the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. Roger is well versed with regard to housing issues, and he was also published in Forbes, among other accomplishments. Roger, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. We also have Miss Allison Drescher back on the panel. Allison is the president of SPOA. She joined the organization in 2020, and she has been a remarkable leader uh, pushing for property rights and sensible housing policies. Allison, thank you for joining us again. Thank you for having me. And we have Mr. Demetrius Salpoglu, who is the CEO of Boston Pads. Demetrius is a wonderful advocate uh, when it comes to housing-related issues and how housing should work for all of us. Demetrius, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me. And we have Mr. Richard Tissay, who is the Senior Advisor at Predi Strategies. Richard has also had a remarkable career in politics. He was a distinguished House representative and senator in the Massachusetts state legislature for approximately 26 years. And although he's spoken to us in this format before, we haven't seen him for a while. So, Richard, it's great to have you back. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, I'm just going to say a few quick words about SPOA. Uh, we are a big tent organization representing different kinds of property owners who have different kinds of businesses. But we do champion the rights of the small mom and pop owners in particular for two main reasons. Uh, number one, they do provide over 60% of the rental housing in Boston and throughout Massachusetts. And many of them run businesses that are female, minority, and family owned. They play a prominent role in funding municipal budgets through the taxes that they pay. And they also provide business to countless other businesses, including the tradespeople, the plumbers, the electricians, the carpenters, and numerous other industries, including but not limited to the, the brokerage, insurance, and banking industries. So they do play a vital role in the health and success of our communities. The other main reason is that the small mom and pop owners are most vulnerable to uh, dangerous policies like rent control. Historically, rent control stunted the construction of new housing. It made it more difficult for owners to collect their hard-earned rental income. It led to existing housing stock falling into disrepair, and it made it more difficult for owners to remove non-compliant tenants from their buildings. This brought harm not only to the owners and their properties, but also to the many other tenants who depended on their landlords to provide them with safe and maintained living spaces. Therefore, we're in a situation right now where rent control is back on the table. Boston Mayor Michelle Wu has proposed it. Other people are proposing it at the state level. 
And even though tenants are having difficult with rising rental prices, we are in a situation right now where property owners are also struggling with rising prices that have to do with repair, maintenance, mortgage, uh, property insurance, and a whole host of other things. Unfortunately, we don't really hear that other side of the equation. Moreover, we're posed with a different challenge. The proponents of rent control tend to come back with the excuse or the claim that the new versions out there are very moderate, harmless versions. They also claim that small mom and pop owners are exempt. If you look more carefully at what they're saying, the exemption applies to owner-occupied buildings of six apartments or less. The problem with that is that the vast majority of owners, including small mom and pop owners, do not fall into that category. Uh, that exemption is not helping a lot of us. And as Allison said herself at one point, what good is a policy where you have to exempt a group of people anyway? But when you really think about it, it's the equivalent of telling someone who owns a small mom and pop coffee shop that the only way they can qualify as a small business is if they serve six customers or less per day. And on top of it, they would have to live inside their coffee shop. And if they stray just one millimeter beyond that strict uh, standard, they would fall in line in the same category with Starbucks or a mega organization that does business throughout all the states in America and throughout multiple uh, countries throughout our big blue earth. And my, my uh, response to that is we have to work with those people to bring them back down to earth to look at things in a more practical way with regard to how we define small businesses. Uh, the average property owner is not BlackRock Vanguard, for instance. Uh, you know, no matter how big your business may be, a lot depends on a combination of different things, including the size of the business, the complexity of your corporate structure, and how far it reaches. So we just have to put that out there. We have to combat misinformation when we hear it, and we have to educate the public not only about the valuable service that we provide, but also about the good people we are. We are not the ogres we've been made out to be. And on that note, I would ask you kindly to please donate to the Small Property Owners Association so that we can advance our advocacy. You can do this by going to www.spoa.com slash join. We would appreciate it if you would consider making a monthly donation, whether it's $100 a month, $500 a month, or whatever you can afford. I say that because we are a group of volunteers. We take time outside of, outside of our day jobs and our businesses to provide advocacy for you and our communities. It's our pleasure to do it, but we do need your help. We have to be in this together. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Roger. Thank you so much for that. And that's uh, that's those, those are some really important and great points. And I, I think that in what I'm gonna talk about today is giving you a picture of what unfolded in Seattle um, over the last decade or so uh, in, in kind of a quick steps that that highlight some of the points that you were making. Um, I, I won't talk about rent control, but more kind of the momentum that built um, in Seattle that led to a lot of regulatory intervention uh, in the in the real estate market, particularly that affected uh, development, uh, building management, uh, housing provider, you know, uh, operations and sort of um, really created an environment that is a very high barrier to enter for in the market, the housing market in Seattle, and ultimately um, adds cost to the product that that you that real estate folks produce, um, manage, operate um, the transactions that go on, all of which ultimately serve the consumer who's looking for some place to live that's that's within their means. So I'm going to share my screen here if this works. And um, so um, Amr said, that, you know, well, to just to introduce what what I have been doing, uh, what is the Center for Housing Economics? We are we are a um, an organization that conducts research and communication and creates projects that support policies and investment to create an abundance of housing options for everyone. The answer to house, rising housing prices is to allow more housing of all kinds everywhere for people of all levels of income. And 
what's critical here is that the, in our message that we deliver over and over is the counter to bad housing policy is crushing information with the truth better stories and having better ideas. And we are all also a 501c4 and we welcome uh, contributions um, as well. And, and our, our our website is housonomics.org. So we this is an organization that evolved out of a local organization in Seattle called Seattle for Growth. But what we saw happening across the country, it was mirroring what was going on in Seattle. And we felt like uh, we needed to speak to a national audience and and sort of educate real estate investors and housing providers and developers and builders on sort of what to look out for and, and support their efforts to push back on many uh, sort of, uh, I mean, just Ill, ill-defined and poorly executed and, uh, you know, interventions in the market that are making things more expensive and difficult for uh, people that are looking for a place to live. So yeah, I, I picked uh, Amr. Uh, this is he, he's 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 changed his he's got a different shirt on there, but he's got the same background, so he's a consistent guy. But I well, wanted... I am a nice guy and a good guy too, so I just want to put that <laughs> yeah. out. There. And I, I was a nationwide search. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and the, and and Amr said it already. You are the you are the good guys. You're the you're 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 not wearing a black hat in this. Um, you are housing entrepreneurs, investors. And, and housing providers. And you do make money doing this, um, but you're doing it providing real value to your customers. And you know most often to people on the lower end of the economic ladder, um, smaller housing providers um, uh, you know, are often that, that bridge between subsidized housing at 60% of area median income to you know, 150% of area median income. So, um, you know, I, I have nothing against big uh, developers. Um, uh, everyone's in the in the business, and it's all marginal business. There's there's no such thing as passive income in this business, as you know. Um, it's hard work, and um, I think it's really important to to remember that when you look in the mirror that you're not uh, a bad person because you're you're in this business any more than someone that runs a bar or restaurant and charges for food or for beer or runs an auto repair shop charges to fix somebody's flat tire. Um, I wanted to point out one example of this is that, that is a difficult, um, a, a very great story, but also one that, uh, that has a warning in it. And I met with a, a, a guy named Brian out in Jackson, Mississippi, who told me that he was able to provide um, a, a mortgage for, pe for uh, people and, um, through a, a process of creating a trust and doing a 30 year mortgage in which he was primary the, you know, the, the lender and he was charging 9% interest. Um, but his monthly mortgage was less than what rents were in Jackson. So he was able to take a, a, a rundown home and, you know, for $35,000, turn it around and put it on the market for about 70. And he was able to get somebody at about 100% of very median income into that house for a mortgage, a monthly mortgage payment that was less than what um, this person would have been paying in a rental unit in Jackson. And that's his business model. And um, I, I, I told him, you know, that's a, that's a great model. Um, but I did warn him and I said, uh, you know, by the way, after five years, um, the, the person, if they've been successful in paying that mortgage and successful in in, in fulfilling their obligations, um, they, they're able to convert that that mortgage, refinance that into a conventional loan. Um, the, the beauty of that is that Brian makes money. The, the the person that's that's living in the home is paying on a mortgage and developing better credit, eventually gets into a conventional mortgage, becomes a homeowner and gets access to generational wealth you know, potential. And all the wonderful things that we talk about when we think of home ownership. But I warned him. I said, if one of those deals turns into a foreclosure, and it's a person that's very sympathetic, and somebody gets a hold of that, uh, you will be on the front page of the paper. And the first thing that people will say is, nine percent interest. That's a usurious interest rate. This is a predatory lender. So you know, he 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 understood what I was saying, but he said, I don't worry about that. This is Jackson, Mississippi. Um, well, I can tell you for sure, um, you, in many places, as you know, you're one newspaper story or television story away 
um, from from getting into regulatory trouble if if something goes wrong, even though it's an outlier, even though you did everything you were supposed to do, and even though that person may not have kept up their end of the deal, um, you can wind up on the wrong end of that. And so there's two sides to the coin, and it's very important um, to keep that in mind. And that's kind of the theme through this presentation. So in Seattle, back in uh, 2009, 2012, as you know, we had that massive um, uh, downturn that was triggered, you know, largely by, by, by real estate um, and by single-family home mortgages. And what happened at that period, of course, people were angry about everything, um, including housing, and Seattle was no different. And you know what happened at that period was demand started to increase because the economy was coming back. And so there was a lot of people moving to Seattle and people wanted to be there. Jobs were being created and there was more opportunity, but the supply was not keeping up with that demand. So prices were going up. And, you know, the, the, the Seattle story is really about how this anger and frustration with something that was, is part of the marketplace, which is, you know, you have you have slow moving local government that's not permitting fast enough, leads to kinks in the supply chain. Uh, prices start to go up, rents start to go up, and who do pe who do people blame? They blame the developers, they blame the jobs, they blame the the uh, the people who are housing providers. And politicians love this story because um, they're able to beat up on somebody that 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 you know you have to write a third of your monthly income to this person. And for your rent or your your mortgage payment, and you know, uh, they're just gouging me. Uh, and so that what happened in Seattle is, we started to see first of all, the big developers, you know, Vulcan and Holland and some of the larger folks that were building in the South Lake Union area, south of downtown. It's kind of an aerial view of that. And what we what we saw there was a desire to create a fee structure that would be attached to every square footage of new development in South Lake Union and downtown in order to generate money for subsidized housing. And, um, you know, initially uh, there, there was a, there was even talk of something called a linkage fee, which would attach to every single square foot of new development in the entire city of, of Seattle. And that fee would go to pay for subsidized low-income housing tax credit housing. Um, would be used to leverage those tax credits. And we engaged with that process and pushed back on it. Um, but eventually, but then, the larger scale developers um, cut a deal for their projects, got fees that they could live with. And, and then that mandatory inclusionary zoning uh, concept, which is which you have in Boston as well, um, you know, they, they, the advocates and the, the, the nonprofit housing developers knew, that private developers did not want to stick rent restricted housing in their in their projects forever. They would rather just pay a fee and get out of it. Well, that's what happened in South Lake Union downtown. But then that it didn't stop there. It continued to um, what we called in those days micro housing, which were smaller um, units in areas that were typically townhomes and. Um, you know, four plexes, maybe six plexes, um, some some very large, uh, uh, smaller count apartment buildings, and micro housing was was fantastic because what it did is it put infill development, thirty or forty units where maybe there would have been four million dollar townhomes before, and created units that were um, smaller, um, but the you know the monthly rent was maybe eleven hundred dollars, twelve hundred dollars, as low as seven or eight hundred dollars in really. Um, very expensive uh, real estate and areas with, you know, a lot of access to transit, a lot of business, a lot of retail. And these projects were perfect for people that were, you know, earning right about that 60 to 80% of area median income. And, and they could live there um, and, and not spend most of their, their, uh, their paycheck on rent. But again, people were, you know, angry and the neighbors said, oh, they're too small. The, these are two. These units are too too small. They're not they're not humane. Um, and what they really did is they they were just angry about the fact that it was mostly single family people that were um, angry about the fact that there was housing going by you know four or five blocks away. Um, and you can see the the red herring kind of over the top stuff that gets said. I've been to Poland. I know what they look like. They're bleak. 
and and they were a great product. They they had no vacancy rate. They were they had waiting lists for them. People loved them. They worked for the consumer, but these angry people came and and shut them down. And microhousing was basically outlawed subsequent to that uh, in the in the following years from the the mandatory inclusionary zoning. Um, then you know we we start to we start to see a move towards the smaller um, uh, builder and 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 housing provider. You know, big landlords and their predatory real estate, uh, you know, gouging renters with totally unconscionable rents. And that was the that's the wrap. And once they got done with the bigger guys and the kind of middle sized, you know, micro developers, you know, we saw all sorts of legislation that was passed first in time legislation. The first person that shows up, you have to rent to that person, um, even though that person is likely to be a white programmer guy who uses the Internet to find a vacancy. And the person that is, you know, a maybe a, a black woman that's got two kids that's out there working her two jobs, she's going to be the one that comes in third or fourth. And you were not allowed to rent to that woman because the other guy showed up first. And this was all in the name of equity and trying to fix a problem with racism. And ultimately it, it, it did nothing for people that truly needed um, how affordable housing. Um, and it was challenged in court and that challenge failed. And so, you know, there are many other, uh, things that came up, including requiring that housing providers had to register people to vote. Um, there was requirements that allowed uh, if a building was going to be sold, the tenants had first right of refusal, which in D.C. functions as kind of a shakedown for the deal. Right. The owner comes in, to, goes to sell. The buyer is going to buy. They exercise their right of first, first refusal. And what that becomes is paying off all the tenants to to, to leave. Um, of course, all that does is push up the price of whatever the, the subsequent you know renters have to pay or the people that move into that building later. Um, so you know we what we what we saw was you know again you know all sorts of limits on deposits, uh, talk about eliminating credit checks, criminal backgrounds, and then finally you know free lawyers for everybody that's going to get evicted. Never mind the fact that recent um, studies have shown even from places like Princeton, I think it was that if you're going to pay a lawyer $500 an hour to defend somebody who owns $500, wouldn't it just be easier to just give them the $500? So, you know, these are schemes that are baked up to pay for, you know, tenant side lawyers and for other advocates and their efforts rather than just solving the problem. And of course, some tenants do need a lawyer. There's nothing wrong with um, having resources for those people that need legal assistance. But the bottom line is, is that adding that requirement in is just going to extend and add more costs to the eviction process, which is already very difficult and, by the way, very rare. Um, but that became, you know, that became the next step in, in Seattle. And of course, uh, right now, Seattle is considering a rent control measure and it's 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 a pretty even chance that it will pass, even though it's against state law. The idea is that it'll pass at the Seattle level, and then um, what will happen is, uh, if the state passes a re removes the preemption, it'll become law in uh, in Seattle. So you know, my theory is, you know, when you have these extortionary fees, they, these are really bribes that are being paid to various, um, you know political power players in the in the conversation all it does is create more inflation which means you know makes it harder for people that are trying to get an affordable place to live because when robin hood goes out to steal from the rich um what happens to the money that he steals well it gets um you know spent on bureaucracy overhead all sorts of you know um, you know contra contractual transactional costs and the people that are supposed to benefit from these redistributive moves um, end up suffering um, from housing scarcity and higher prices because of all the inflation that's created to pay all the, the fees and requirements and all the increased risk from these interventions. So one thing that I've been a strong advocate for to kind of turn this around is giving people cash for rent. Um, I was talking with someone just the other day about how unfortunate the COVID relief was, I, I was able to avail myself of a PPP loan, which was very easy to get because the banks basically fronted the money and then they kind of cleaned it up on the back end. And we begged at the federal and state and local level, please make COVID relief like PPP. Just 
have the banks distribute the, the, the rent relief directly to the, to the housing provider, that means that the person that lost their job through no fault of their own is made, you know, doesn't have to worry about their rent. The housing provider is made whole, can pay their bills, and we just take care of it, right? Um, and they refuse to do that. And so instead, all that money went to states that tried to subcontract it to local governments and then to nonprofits. And as you've read in the headlines, a lot of that money disappeared and we never even made it to the the, the tenant who still to this day has, you know, a four-figure back rent bill due and either will never pay it or will um, have it on their record for the rest of their 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 lives. Um, so the idea behind cash for rent is that when you have problems in the market with people that can't pay, um, rather than spend it on all these other uh, complicated mechanisms, the, the most straightforward thing is to just solve that rent problem that, that month and the next month. And the numbers bear out if you, if, because I've run those numbers over and over, that it's far less costly than light tech development, far less costly than lawyers for tenants. Um, and, and ultimately, it plays into the redistributive uh, you know, uh, narrative that the, that the advocates for things like rent control believe in. So it puts them immediately in a position of having to say, no, don't give tenants cash because they don't know what to do with it. Or no, that will solve the problem and then we won't have anything to complain about. So taking cash subsidies directly from their source immediately to the tenant or the resident um, takes away all those arguments uh, because what you're doing is solving the problem and taking the subsidy and being efficient with it. So, um, you know, this is this is essentially an idea that, you know, we've been pushing for quite a while. And, uh, you know, again, it, it, it's it's a real solution. It actually would solve the problem. But importantly, from a communication standpoint, it puts you in a much better um, position um, than it would than than all these other things. And in and, and particular, um, you know, legal challenges and efforts in the lobbying sphere, you know, might be necessary. But you when you win, you lose, um, because if you're successful in the legal arena, you did it because you're greedy landlords who have a lot of money to hire fancy lawyers to squash the will of the people. So it's a it's a it's a defeat in the end. Um, what's really critical is bringing the public along so that they understand that you have, as I pointed out, um, better ideas, better solutions, and you're part of the solution, not part of the part of the problem. Um, so cash for rent is compassionate, would show you as a problem solver and that you're not interested in laughing all the way to the bank. You're interested in running a business that's friendly to your customers and supports their, their well-being. So that's that's the end of that and, and happy to entertain questions and conversation. Thank you, Roger. Uh, you mentioned the importance of telling the truth. Uh, could you give us an example of that? Well, you know, Matthew Desmond from the Eviction Lab has made a career out of uh, going around the, the country telling communities that they have an eviction epidemic um, or an eviction crisis. Um, this is just plain false. Uh, let's start with the word epidemic. An epidemic is a, an aberration in uh, disease prevalence. So let's say you've got, you know, the, the common cold and 10,000 people have the common cold in Boston in any given year. Um, an epidemic is when in year seven or eight or nine of the measurement, you see a spike and there's 20,000 or 30,000. I mean, we just lived through a huge epidemic. We all know what it means. Um, there is no epidemic in in uh, in eviction because Matthew Desmond only has one year of data. So typically he's been walking around the country with one year of data saying, you know, Boston has a 7% eviction rate. That's an epidemic. Well, false. <laughs> it's just not true. It's a lie. Um, in order to have an epidemic, you have to have years of eviction data and then show that it's somehow dramatically increased. Even if it did, he doesn't explain why it did or give us any reasons how to fix it, except to impose a myriad of regulatory uh, stuff that just doesn't really address the problem, which is we don't know what it is, right? Because when you look at all the evictions that are filed, um, most of them resolve. And by the time you're done, we looked at Cincinnati, for example, where there was a, uh, I believe it was a 7% eviction rate according to the, to the eviction lab. When you actually looked at it, it was more like, you know, 
the, the actual number of filings was less than that. And by the time you got all the way to the sheriff showing up and hauling away people's things, it was less than 1% of all the people in rental housing in the Cincinnati area. So being able to get the facts like that together and repeat that in the media and get that out there is absolutely critical. It's not enough by itself. Um, but it's essential that you you kind of constantly are, are myth busting um, the things that the other side says. And what about better ideas? Can good ideas really overcome bad ideas, given the way things are? Again, not by themselves, but I think that you you that they're they're necessary but not sufficient. Um, I think the cash for rent idea is a good one because it 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 really does change the conversation away from complaining about woe is me, the the poor landlord getting beaten up to here's an actual solution. If people can't pay the rent, let's just pay it. Um, doesn't come without any sort of consequence, but it changes the conversation to why shouldn't we do that? Uh, as opposed to, um, you know, why um, you're in trouble when everyone's worried about that tenant and everybody's worried about that story. Um, and so I think I, some good ideas like that can, not only they, can they work to solve the problem, but they shift the conversation away from yourself um, and towards the, the individual that everybody is saying they're concerned about. And when it comes to telling better stories, could you clarify that a little bit? And could you please tell us whether or not that worked in Seattle? It was too little too late in Seattle, but the example, you know, where Seattle failed and, and learning from failure is important. You know, when when the pandemic hit, the first thing that that the Rental Housing Association did is went and talked to the mayor and said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and, and impose a, 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 you know, a, a, a an eviction moratorium, even though eviction had nothing to do with the problem that we were facing at that time. The problem was that businesses were going to shut down people were going to lose their income and they wouldn't be able to pay the rent, right? Problem was getting people money to pay the rent, um, not banning eviction. Um, and instead of making, and this happened in Berkeley and other places where in order to look like they were trying to help, rental associations and other uh, housing provider groups went and immediately capitulated to, the, to that instead of putting out a press release, getting a landlord, that's working with a person that just lost their job because of COVID and strategizing and figuring out how to get through this together and getting a visual on TV that showed that saying, my God, what are we going to do? All these people are losing their jobs. They're not going to be able to pay rent. I'm concerned about my resident. Um, you know, I, we're, we're kind of standing here together talking about how are we going to get through this together? You know, it was the, that would have been the best message to get out um, early on. Um, but instead, all it became all about eviction bans instead of rent relief. Um, so, so putting a story with that would have been very helpful. And I think always thinking about what is the person that's watching TV and, and keep in mind that television reporters do their stories and they're 90 seconds to 120 seconds long. Mm -hmm. And they need to see a picture and they need to see something positive with you in it or one of your people in it. And that's... Mm -hmm. Um, that's really, really critical. And so when it comes to what happened in Seattle, is that inevitable? I mean, it seems that we've gone down this road pretty far. So is it possible to turn things around? Uh, look look in the mirror. It's up to you. Um, if you focus on better communication strategies with the general public and understanding why they think rent control is or is not a good idea. And again, get real human beings like the like the guy I mentioned who was doing the, you know, the 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 uh, the, the the mortgage lending himself um, and putting people in homes. Getting people like that out there is key. Um, lawsuits is not going to do it. Law, I think legal challenges tend to aggravate the situation and they cost you a lot of money. And they're indeterminate in their outcome. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what kind of decision you're going to get. You don't know what's going to happen on appeal. Um, you need to do things at the state capitol that are uh, address the current problem. But legislators don't care about you. They care about their voters. 
And if their voters think rent control is a good idea, it doesn't matter how much data and argument you produce, you will lose. And uh, Washington state has never learned that. Neither has anyone else in the country. So it's up to you. Um, you've got to invest big time in research and public opinion, and then you have to change it. Um, otherwise, yes, it's inevitable. And you will be facing uh, certainty of rent control and more and more of the same. And it'll never go away once you get it. There isn't a single jurisdiction I'm aware of that's ever repealed rent control. So it, it's a tough slog. You got to fight the fight against what's in front of you now, but you have to be thinking about how to change the public opinion so that the average person uh, realizes that what you're doing is not passive income. It's a marginal business, just like all the other local businesses that they love and want to protect. Um, that's the same thing you're doing. Um, so uh, I have found over and over again that, that the reluctance of folks to organize around those principles has led to more and more uh, bad regulation. Well, for what it's worth, the voters of Massachusetts did repeal it here in 1994. I'm just putting it out there just so there isn't too much. That's a good example. Doom, I didn't know that. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So I just want to introduce Mr. Jim Eisenberg, who joined us uh, while you were speaking. Jim is a senior policy advisor with Predi Strategies. He also spent a number of years on Beacon Hill advising the Massachusetts Speaker of the House. Jim, it's good to see you. Hey, Amir. Thank you. It's great to be here. And with that, I just want to open this up for discussion with the panel, cash for rent, other issues. Does anyone have anything they want to share? Any views, any opinions, any pros, any cons? I think a lot of what Roger said um, is correct. And a lot of his examples, um, we could take heart in and, and try to implement here. We, the Massachusetts um, has had a lot of the same problems as Seattle and other places where real estate values have really gone through the roof. And especially uh, here in Boston, where we've had so much economic development. Um, at the same time, we haven't been meeting the production goals that Massachusetts needs and the greater Boston area needs, um, you know, to, to ensure that we have an ample renting rental stock. Um, so, you know, in real estate, they always say three things you need is location, location, location. Um, for this discussion, it's really production, production, production. And we need to be, you know, super innovative and figure out, um, you know, the things that we can do to spur the private sector right now, um, you know, to increase production. And I don't I know Seattle and some of the Western states are a little different. Here we have 351 cities and towns. They all have their own building codes and, you know, um, zoning regulations. And, you know, so it's an extra hurdle um, that we face, you know, in this area. But I, the legislature under um, Governor Baker and now uh, Governor Healy, you know, uh, really have been more focused on the production aspect than, um, than the rent control um, aspect of things. Allison, do you have any thoughts? Um, I, I think it's um, some really good ideas and certainly interesting to hear. I, I, we frequently hear about we need to be pro something. It's really important that we we not come to the table being against everything. So um, I, I certainly think that in terms of simplicity and exchanging directly goods for a service or, you know, in order to be compensated, um, I think it's actually a model that works for both people. So I could, I, both parties, I, I could see it um, working. And um, I just had a question for Roger in that um, I'm not, where is Seattle with housing today? That's just not something I'm informed about. What have been the ramifications in terms of where's their housing market? Well, I mean, I think, you know, post COVID, everything is kind of, kind of haywire. So it's, you know, I think they're still experience, they're still experiencing, I, I think, a lack of single family inventory. Uh, people are still in the market looking for those and not finding them. Price, you know, prices have stayed high uh, for single family in, in the rental world. I, I think 
overall in the country, we're seeing rents trending downward. Um, I think the same thing happened in Seattle, um, but it's, it, it's, it's maintained, you know, that hasn't dropped enough to really make people feel like the, the problem has been solved. Um, and what's worse is that Seattle keeps voting for more and more uh, money to be poured on the situation. So we just passed in Seattle, passed a, uh, a public, uh, public housing legislation that would create yet another entity that would you know, borrow or tax to create more subsidized housing. And again, the, it's no different than um, than what uh, Richard described it, across the country. Regulatory overreach, whether it's a town holding things up or a city, uh, multiple jurisdictions, it's, it's regulatory slowdown of production that causes the prices to go up. And, and what happens is, that when those prices rise, the first thing the electeds do is go after LIHTC, you know, funding or LIHTC, you know, for tax credits. And then the nonprofits take other money, put that together with LIHTC, and they build these very inefficient, very expensive uh, subsidized apartments. And those don't solve the problem. So they keep going back more money, more money. And as Milton Friedman said, you know, Wherever there's more money, there's more inflation and higher prices. So this is a kind of a national problem. As the locals choke supply and prices go up, the solution is always more money into that system. And you know we have to find a way to stop that. And um, that's going on across all the country across the country. Demetrios, that's actually a very good segue for you. What do you think? The you know having developed lots of properties, managed thousands of units over the course of 20 years. You you notice patterns, you notice patterns when you develop properties and and you can see, you know, that there is more uh, regulations and hurdles in development every five years. They keep adding more and more complexity. They want green, they want this, they want that. And, and that's fine, but it, you can't, and I've said this as only, you can't expect to walk on a Honda, um, you know, car lot and expect to get a Mercedes at the same price, right? So like you're not, your your Mercedes costs more. There's a reason for it. Your Honda costs differently. They're trying to, you know, keep adding stuff, which makes it a Mercedes, makes it a better car. But the problem is they want the cost to be at the Honda level. That's just not going to work. And so your cost per square foot of development has been going up precipitously even prior to, to you know, uh, the pandemic. I think the pandemic exacerbated it, interest rates exacerbated it. Uh, look look at where we are today. You talk to any developers, and I talk to a lot of them. I mean, I just was at a job site just now with a developer. And, um, you know, it, I think if you had said to me five years ago, we'd be paying $380, $400 a square foot for new construction, I would just laughed you out of the room. And now it seems to be, you know, something that's realistic. And so, We've doubled costs literally in five years and uh, something has to give. Now, the first thing that gives is that you can't give affordable rents when your cost per square foot is so high because it doesn't pencil. So you need the rent to cover the construction. Now, there's good and there's bad in any city, right? Boston's a tremendous city, incredibly high incomes. We all know that more family offices than any location. We have, I think, the lowest unemployment rate now in this, it, I think lower than we had it in 2019. So clearly there's tons of jobs and there's a lot of people, you know, that are, are prosperous, but that's demand, it's demand driver. People are coming to the city, rents go up. So it's easy to pick a scapegoat, but the ultimately it is supply and we are doing terrible at supply. And 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 the permits are, are going down. Now, it can be argued, there's a, a million reasons why, you know, uh, you know, Permits are going down, but I think it's not that complicated to figure out, right? If you're going to keep adding more and more standards to development that raises the cost in an inflationary environment with high interest rates, inability to borrow, coupled with supply chain issues and the like, there's a lot of risk. And I think that politicians grab onto that. They, you know, they 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 find people that may not understand the construction process, the financing process, and different things. And so it's easy to grab people and give it like a, you know, kind of a quick, hey, look, 
you know, these are greedy developers. They're not. I mean, they're, there are more developers than I've ever seen in my entire real estate career bringing development deals, putting them on my desk and saying, Demetrius, can you sell this? Because I can't. I can't make this pencil. Let's see if someone else would take that over. Now, this is a once in maybe a, a, a generational thing, right? So you have to have very high rents to cover the high construction costs. Um, and I think that that's what we're looking at. And I think we're going to be in that period for a little bit. I do believe that land costs are exceptionally high in Boston. That's another thing. I do believe we have to go vertical. It's a very small city. I do believe we have to upzone and add height so that we can offset some of those costs. I think subsidizing housing is not the solution. I think it's rapidly increasing you know, supply. And so any and all opportunities to do that through any means necessary, I think is the way to go. And let me be let, let me be clear in terms of subsidized housing. I think the better incentive would be to incentivize developers because if you gave them tax breaks, if you gave them um, streamlined uh, permitting process, getting things through quicker, more inspectors to come look at the property quicker, more responsibility on that end, things would get developed quicker. We know, I know personally that when you go to build something and you take your life savings to you know to develop this property. You may have your life savings tied up for two or three years. Now, imagine if your project doesn't make it at the end. You got less than minimum wage. No one works in America for free for two or three years. That's a huge risk for developers. So I, I don't I, I think that people point and say, oh, you know, there's rich, greedy developers, but the amount of risk that developers are taking, you know, to be entrepreneurial is is not sung enough. And so I think that needs to be explained. There's an incredible risk associated with that. And when your construction project is slowed down every month, uh, and I think this is lost in the general public, you're still paying your taxes, you're still paying your carrying costs, you're still paying uh, insurance to get the project to the end. Meanwhile, your profit is going down the whole entire time. So I think it's no small wonder that we have less production. So I think that incentivizing developers is the, the right idea. Uh, rezoning most, if not all, of the entire city to add height and allow parcels to be combined and do some some new would open up some new opportunities. I think all housing is good. I think you know from by all means necessary, but it requires like some significant changes in what we need to do. Richard, did you want to add something? No, yeah, exactly. Um, that's exactly what we need: production and in. You know, aside from going vertical and some of the things um, that were just mentioned, I'd also throw in accessory apartments, um, you know, building something new. Um, there are a lot of hurdles, but there are a lot of if you really want to impact the market quickly, some you know zoning relief to allow for more accessory apartments um, really would be something that um, would have. You know, an immediate any type of micro housing would have type uh, a really immediate um, impact. Mm -hmm. I, I might also add too that there's a there's a lot of discussion now about converting the skyscraper or office use buildings. We're hearing a lot about that, a lot of press coverage. Um, and I think this is something we confront in housing a lot, that while that's a great idea, um, the actual facts of the matter are the buildings need to be repurposed, but a very, very small amount of them are actually suitable for housing conversion uh, because of column width spread and other engineering challenges. But there's also an economic factor that uh, McKinsey recently published a study that there is $900 billion worth of losses that need to cycle through the marketplace, which means the ownership of those buildings. Are they going to go into foreclosure? Are they going to be given back to the banks? So I think a lot of the ideas that we see coming from the municipalities, this is a, a program of the city of Boston, the idea is well intended, but it's just commencing. And I think that there is actually a lack of understanding of the complexity of that work and the economic cycles accompanying it that would even make it possible. So this is one reason, again, I think it's critical that housing providers, construction professionals, developers be part of the discussion with legislators, because saying turning around tomorrow and you need to do it to you know, right away in this lending environment, I mean, the soft costs on something like that is extraordinary. So I think that's 
and the positive is that's really why we need people in this industry to be vocal and part of decision making, because it may be able to shed some light on the fact that that's just not a realistic overnight solution. It's just simply not possible. Thank you. Th those are good points. And I, I'm curious, uh, Jim, when and Jim and Richard, both of you can take this. Um, when it comes to what Roger was saying about cash for rent, uh, from a policy standpoint, and obviously there are property owners who won't, not all of them will agree with this. We're just talking about an idea. But what do you think about that from a policy perspective as far as gaining buy-in and potentially presenting it to the state legislature? Yeah, I think that, uh, that well, Massachusetts has a fairly long-standing program called RAFT, Rental Assistance for Families in Transition. Um, there have been some problems with it that have been identified from the landlord's perspective, to be sure. Um, and it was increased a lot during the pandemic due to, to federal aid coming in. But it's it's capped at 50% of uh, AMI, 60% uh, for certain families that may be in, um, considered uh, at risk. Uh, but the major problems, and I think that there is legitimate interest in the legislature in, in increasing funding for that program. Major problem that we've run into uh, from the landlord's perspective is, th is that the applications have to be made by the tenants and they have to be made under what are quote unquote emergency circumstances. So they've received a notice to quit or they've you know undergone a significant life change, whatever it might be. Um, and because many of the tenants you know, have been unable to uh, to go through what is a fairly bureaucratic and rigorous application process, a lot of that money has been left on the table. So what we've been advocating for is a process where landlords can apply on behalf of their tenants. That's met with some significant resistance by advocacy groups. You know, for a number of different reasons that I'm sure everybody here is, is familiar with. But I would say that that our two main goals with respect to, to cash assistance that that uh, helps out tenants who are struggling are, number one, increasing the overall cap, because obviously as rents you know, increase, that cap is going to become less and less helpful. And then second, making it possible for landlords to directly apply for assistance when their tenants are unable to apply. Yes, we were advocating for efficient aid programs where the landlords would get the the rental payments directly, as far uh, as opposed to using tenants as the uh, the intermediaries or the middlemen, which only delayed the process further. I appreciate that. Okay, Roger, did you uh, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Um, one one thing that's important to note is there's absolutely nothing that's been said here today that is revolutionary, unique, and not being said a thousand times across the country today. Um, and it's all right. It's all the right stuff, um, including making cash programs easier to use and re and for real rather than bureaucratic uh, bureaucratic morass like voucher programs or the program you described. Um, what is not being done is the deep uh, public opinion research to understand why people are not going to go for this stuff and why advocates are so able to tap into resentment, into uh, misunderstanding, whatever it is that's out there, because the the static you're running into at the Capitol or in the media or the press or wherever, even the courts, is because people think that you buy stuff with cash, you jack up the rents, and you laugh all the way to the bank. And so when someone says, well, let's let the landlord apply, it's very easy for the general public to believe, and therefore the elected officials, that the landlords are going to steal the money. And that sounds absurd, and it is, but that's what people think, and that's what they'll hear, and they will make decisions that way. So unless and until, and I'm going to say those two words again to you, and I'll say it as, many, as long as people listen, unless and until you spend I would just throw a number out twice as much as you're spending on lobbying and legal stuff on public opinion research to really understand why people think the way they do about rental housing and housing in general, and then develop a communication strategy that is sustained over many quarters, um, not just a week or once one event. Um, you're not going to make any headway and it's not, you're not going to address all of these fundamental, very cogent points that you've made about supply and production. No, it's not going to matter to the people that make the decisions because what they're going to hear is 
I want you to make them pay for it because they have all the money and they're powerful and they're wealthy and they're white and that's what they do. And that's going to resonate, particularly in a state like Massachusetts. So unless and until you you start to make that investment and that commitment, um, the, po- the political cards are always going to be against you. So that's the last piece of advice that's probably not welcome, but it, it's what that's all I can say after doing this for 10 years. That's where we're at. We appreciate your advice. We're going to do our best to follow it. We do have to keep telling our stories and we have to keep working hard to reach people to let them know that we're doing our best. We're good people and we're just trying to provide others with safe housing, maintained housing. And in return for respecting their dignity, they have to respect our dignity as well. Roger, we hope you come back again. On behalf of SPOA, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really, I wish I could be there in person and and I'm sorry I have to jump off, but uh, let me know how else I can help. Of course, of course. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you Roger. Well, Roger had a good point. What he said wasn't original or new. We've heard these comments before, but it is important to repeat these comments. It is important to have these conversations more and more because we have to reach a wider audience, ladies and gentlemen. We have to get more people to listen to us. And more importantly, we need to get more property owners to step up and to advocate for themselves. We know that people are suffering right now. And we know that it's important to respect our tenants. But where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line between protecting tenants and respecting their rights versus taking away every last right a property owner could ever have? We do good work. And we have to tell people, we have to educate people about the good work that we do. Therefore, I encourage all of you to join us. Please help SPOA. Please donate to SPOA at spoa.com slash join. I know that it can be overwhelming when we consider all of these dreadful proposals like rent control, tenant right of first refusal, the sealing of eviction records, and other proposals. If you're a property owner, you have every right to be upset and you have every right to be concerned. But as stated earlier, it's not enough to be against these proposals. We also have to be for something. We have to come up with compassionate and constructive solutions to solve the housing dilemma for everyone. It's not easy to deal with negative stereotypes, to deal with hatred, to deal with ignorance. But I'm reminded of a quote by Henry Nouwen, who said that when we're confronted with darkness, we have to be the light. We have to be the light for ourselves, and we have to be the light for others. And in that spirit, I encourage you once again to join SPOA and to follow SPOA and to stay with us in these efforts. Because we have to come up with solutions to protect our tenants, to protect our properties, and to protect our property rights while we defend our dignity and our safety as property owners. My name is Amir Shah Savari. And until next time, I wish you well.